Mr. Buffett, my name is Bill Ackman. I'm from New York City. And my question relates to the appeal of Solomon Brothers as an investment. Um, you talked earlier about uh, leverage and the dangers of leverage. Solomon is a business which is levered 30 to 1, which has very narrow margins and earns a relatively modest return on equity in light of the amount of leverage that they use. What is the appeal of the business um, to you? Before we go on to Buffett's answer, I want to give a quick background to this story. This question was asked by Bill Ackman to Warren Buffett at the 94 Berkshire Annual Meeting. Buffett initially invested $700 million in Solomon's convertible preferred stock in 1987 and Berkshire became the largest shareholder. By 1990-91, Solomon's top trader, Paul Moser, broke the treasury's billing rules on several occasions and the top management failed to report his misconduct to the regulators until August 91. Buffett, in order to save his investment and most importantly his reputation, stepped in and became the interim chairman of Solomon in August 91 and stayed in that role until May 92, when he was succeeded by Robert Denham. In the end, Solomon settled with the regulators for $290 million and reduced its leverage by shrinking its balance sheet. In 97, it merged with Travelers Group, which later became part of Citigroup. Berkshire Hathaway ultimately saw its stake more than double when Travelers Group bought Solomon in 1997. We have here today the uh, chief executive of Solomon Inc., the parent company, and, and also the chief executive of Solomon Brothers, the investment banking uh, arm. And uh, uh, I would say one of the things we, Charlie and I, feel extraordinarily good about are, are the, uh, the two fellows that are running that operation. We, they they, they uh, did an exceptional job under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, as did John McFarlane, who's all, also here today. Uh, the, the three of them, I mentioned four people in the annual report. and. Uh, Solomon wouldn't be here today uh, without uh, those three, and, the, and it wouldn't be the company in the future that it's going to be without them. And they, they, they did an absolutely fabulous job. It's the sort of business that, as you point out, uses a lot of leverage. It doesn't, in one way, it doesn't use as much as it looks like, and in another way, it uses even more than it looks like. Uh, uh, but it, uh, the test will be, A, whether they uh, control that business in a way that that leverage does not prove uh, dangerous, and secondly, what kind of returns on equity they, they earn uh, while using it. You certainly should expect to earn somewhat higher returns on equity when you are necessarily exposed to a small amount of systemic risk and, 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 and significant amounts of borrowed money than you would in, in, in a business that's uh, that's an extremely plain vanilla business. But uh, I don't know whether you've met uh, uh, Bob and Derek, but uh, uh, I think you'd feel better about having a leverage in their hands than about any other hands you can imagine. Charlie? Why don't we have those three gentlemen stand up? Yeah, you ought to give they them really a hand. They really have done a job yeah. for uh, Berkshire in this yeah. last year. I'll leave the applause for them. <laughs> where, where are they? There they are. I mentioned this before, but I, I, it's worth mentioning again. Derek took on the job of being the operating head of Solomon Brothers on, on uh, what, August 18, 1991. Uh, he didn't know what, he couldn't know what he was getting into exactly. Uh, he, uh, two months later or three months later, we never had a conversation about compensation. He did not ask me for Berkshire or my guarantee of, for indemnification because he's walking into unknown legal problems. We didn't know what the, we would finally uncover. And he worked uh, uh, incredible hours to keep that place together, which was not easy. Bob Denham, I called, uh, I guess, on the 23rd or so, 20, I called him on a Friday, I got home on a Saturday, the 24th of August. He was living a nice, pleasant, peaceful life in uh, California and uh, had, had a first-class law firm, good group of clients. Wife uh, had a good job there, and uh, I told him I was in a mess and there wasn't any second choice. And three days later, he was back in New York and living in a small apartment in Battery City. and, and uh, and handling the general counsel's job at, uh, at, at Solomon 
They found John McFarlane on that Sunday on the 18th. I think he was running on a triathlon or something. Not a practice that Charlie and I follow, but uh, <laughs> they, and he was yanked from that and came down. And I, I think John lives over in New Jersey, but he holed up in the downtown athletic club. And he, it was his job to keep funding what was then a $150 billion balance sheet uh, during a period when people right and left were canceling us, not because we weren't a good credit, but because they just didn't want to have anything to do with us for a while. And uh, the World Bank and the st State of Texas Pension Fund and CalPER, all these people were, were shutting off funding at a time, and, 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 and funding in a f business, as gentleman just indicated, is the lifeblood of, a, of an enterprise like uh, Solomon. And uh, so those three uh, deserve an enormous uh, hand, by, really by the Solomon shareholders, but by this group in turn, because we have an important investment in it. So I thank them publicly. So that was the question and answer between Bill Ackman and Warren Buffett. I just want to say that even 30 years ago, you could see how smart of an investor Bill Ackman was, and he is someone that I really try to learn from and follow what he does with the money he manages at Pershing Square. His question was very solid. He said that Solomon Brothers at the time was levered 30 to 1. Of course, while that number sounds like a lot for regular companies like Pepsi, it is not that crazy for a financial institution, but still high. He then said that the business had narrow margins and low return on equity. Just these three points, especially for an investor like me who wants to stay mostly out of financial institutions, these three points would be more than enough for me to put Salomon into my too hard pile. Meaning, I would not invest in them simply because the business is too hard for me to understand. Ekman wanted to know why Berkshire still owns Salomon. One thing we have to keep in mind is that because Berkshire still owns Salomon stock, Buffett had to be real careful about his answer. Meaning, he couldn't give that much detail about his answer. But being a student of Dale Carnegie, he still gave a great answer. And a little more background on the Buffett and Salomon deal, in 1987, Buffett bought 700 million of Salomon Brothers convertible preferred stock, which paid a fixed dividend of 9% and could be converted into common stock at $38 per share after three years. He did not expect the stock to triple in value, but he thought it was a good deal given the market conditions at the time. However, in 1991, Salomon's traders violated the treasury's bidding rules by submitting unauthorized bids in the names of their customers, and Salomon's senior management failed to report the misconduct to the authorities for months. The trader's motive was to gain more than the 35% of the auction securities and to profit from the resulting market power and price movements. This led to Salomon's temporary ban from bidding as a primary government securities dealer, which was lifted on August 3, 1992. In the end, Salomon agreed to pay a total of 200 than $90 million in fines. If that ban had stayed, the firm was going to go bankrupt. So Buffett got on the call with the Fed and warned that if the ban wasn't to be removed, the firm would go bankrupt, and that could have a huge impact on the global financial system. On the call, Buffett even said that it was the most important day in his life. And the Fed lifted the ban on Solomon's 35%, but they kept Solomon from buying any treasuries under the name of their clients. And the person that gave Buffett this news was actually the current chair of Fed, Jerome Powell. After that, Buffett started deleveraging the business and gave his seat to Robert Denham. In the end, Buffett was completely out of Solomon by 1997. But this question, as I said before, was asked in 1994. So we couldn't get the best answer that we could have from Warren Buffett. However, I think the story with Buffett and Solomon was very good, especially showing us the literally the best investor of all time makes mistakes. So that was it for today. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe. Take care.